absorb it, Father, having eyes to see and ears to hear and a heart that will understand what you have prepared for us, what you have laid out for us. Lord, in the table in the midst of our enemies is a feast. We can come and eat at any time, and the enemy is kept away from it. So, Lord, we can approach you at any time. May we never leave you, never dis disappoint you in any way. And when we do, we know we are always invited in your heart and in your presence, Lord God. And we look forward to meeting with you with other people that love you. And we praise you in Jesus' precious name. Those of you who are coming by uh, YouTube, we just welcome you. Uh, welcome to the garage. If you have a little low on oil or low in your tires or you need a tune-up, great place for you to be. Welcome in Jesus' name. So I love this season. Don't you love this season? Yeah. Amen. For unto us was a child was born. Okay? Amen. And the son was given. Isaiah 9, 6. All right. I love the time of year. I love to smell the wassail and see the lights and do all that, even though there's a lot of mixture, a lot of different things going on in the world. We see the greatest miracle ever on this day that we honor the birth of Christ. Now, you know and I know that Jesus was not born December 20. 25th, right? Was it 25th? <laughs> Amen. Jesus. But we know, in fact, historians will say, not all of them, but some of them will say because of the change of the calendar, Israelites got two calendars. They have the uh, ceremonial calendar where their feasts are all lined up, and then they have their regular calendar, okay? And their feast calendar, Jesus is born somewhere in April. Okay, and their other calendar somewhere in September. But I like to say this, I know the devil likes to think that this is his world. And if Jesus was born somewhere in the first week of April, what day do you think mocks, huh? April Fool's Day, April 1st. Think about that. You know, if you hated Jesus with all your heart, and you thought you were the God of this world, wouldn't you have a day that Jesus, you knew he was born, try to make it the fool's day? Well, just like the devil just gives himself away. Another thing about the enemy is if you're really paying attention and walking with the Lord, the Lord will tip you off when the enemy is anywhere around so you can make adjustments uh, to not open any doors or any avenues where the enemy can come on in. You follow what I'm saying? So go with me to Genesis 3.15. Let's look at the first prophecy concerning the coming of the Messiah or the seed being born. Genesis chapter 3, book of beginnings, verse 15. Most of you probably can quote it by now. And it says, I will put enmity between you and the woman and between your seed, your offspring, and her offspring. And he, Jesus, shall bruise your head, and you shall bruise his heel. Basically, what he's saying is, because you've caused mankind to fall, and because you have done this thing, Satan, the person that I have to crush your face, to crush your authority, to smash your, your assignments will be the seed of a woman. Hello. Now, you and I both know, you, most of you are adults, the seed comes from the male and not the woman. She has the egg. The male has the seed. All right? We'll just keep it without <laughs> getting really deep into it. Now, the woman passes on the nutrients while the male passes on the bloodline. A lot of people say, well, why do we see a lot of males mentioned in the Old Testament and we don't see a lot of females because they were passing on the bloodlines? God knows everybody. There's not a hair off of their head that he doesn't know. He recognizes all of that. Amen? So the seed, it means offspring. It would be the offspring of Mary coming forth that would crush Satan's power. Herein was the Son of God manifested that he destroy the works of the devil, over in 1 John. And it says, and he will bruise your head or crush your authority, 
and you will chase or shall bruise his heel. Now, amen, when Jesus was hanging on the cross, seemed like dogs below him barking and scratching. Psalms 22 describes that they're like a bunch of ravenous wolves barking at his feet. Amen. And when Jesus walked as a man, did he have any problems? Lots of them. People barking at his heels and doubting and challenging and doing all that. So wonder that you and I once in a while. That my battery. So anyway, they're you know chasing his heel, chasing his heel, chasing his heel. But Jesus knew he came for one reason. And one reason only. And that reason was to redeem you and I and to rescue us and to seal us for deliverance, for to get out of here. We're going to see this here in just a minute. A couple of points underneath that. Number one, if you're taking notes, your seed, the seed of evil, okay, the offspring, the tactics, everybody underneath the leadership of the enemy will work against Christ. Amen? How about today? Are there people working against Christ? There's a whole system. We call it the world system. And it's designed to tear human beings down, to bait them, to tear them down. It's designed to discourage us. And it's designed to mock God. Peter said in the last days that mockers would come. People that make fun of God, people that will will say he's not coming, he's he's delaying this, he's not doing all that. That's the work of the seed of the serpent, the devil's seed, his offspring. Now, whether you know this or not, but when you and I were born in this earth, we were born alive until the age of accountability. Now, you, I know you know that. And then we separated from God. So automatically, evil took over and seared us away from the Lord. That's why we must be born again. That's why we must accept Jesus Christ into our hearts so he can release our spirit and we can again walk with God, talk with God. When the Father looks at us, he looks at us through the blood of Jesus and he sees us righteous. He sees us justified, just if you and I never sinned. That's how the Father looks at us through Christ. So it's only you and I and the enemy's lies that tells us we're worthless. Sometimes we'll blow up, we'll make a mistake, but still God doesn't stop loving us. Still God doesn't stop caring. Why? Because he needs to rescue us out of this planet. This planet has no peace, no rest in it that comes from the enemy, but everything that comes that's peaceful and comes from God comes down through the Spirit of God, God working through you, God working in you, and God working with you. Can you say amen? With, in, and through. Wow, that's really great. So our seed is good now. Our life has changed. There's only one thing that hangs around our life that once in a while can get out of hand. You know, and everybody knows what it is. Our, our self, our flesh self, right? Yep, it's, it's our flesh, that, uh, that part that's, that can't go to heaven. Now, can anybody tell me why our flesh can't go to heaven? Because there's a sin nature in the flesh part. That's what makes us age. That's what makes us get older. That makes us break down and get sick once in a while, God forbid. Makes, makes things break, quit. As we get older, you know what I'm saying? Amen. But meanwhile, the Bible says that while our outer man gets older or perishes, our inward man, because Jesus lives in here, gets renewed day by day. So basically for you and I, our job is to stay in the presence of God as long as we can to get as much of God as we can. And I'm not talking about being religious I'm just staying in the presence of God. I'm not dumping the garbage. I'm not driving anywhere. I'm not going. No, that's not what we're talking about. We're talking about everywhere you go, God is. Which person are you dwelling on yourself? 
the enemy, what he's doing, or you're dwelling on God. So you take God everywhere you go. He's filled you. And, you know, I've, I've discovered a long time ago, everywhere I go, there I am. <laughs> and I need God in every instant, every moment of that. Amen? So the devil will try, second point, to use anything that he can to attack us mentally or physically. Okay, I, I want to clarify here. And try to keep God's seed from working in our hearts and, and keeping others from receiving God's sin. Now, I want to let you know, Satan does not have the key to your back door. Denise, he can't attack you whenever he wants. We have to flag him. Now, this is what Christians need to know. That's why I'm a stickler for you to come to church, and, and not just any church, this church, because the teaching is really good here to teach you how to fend off the lies of the enemy. A lot of places are great churches, believe it or not, and they're full of God's lovely people, but they're not given anything scripturally. They're giving you five points to do this, five points to do that, five points to do that, but where's the scripture that goes into your heart and explodes and gives you an understanding so that you can make your own five points? What are you talking about? Well, when I was away from God's people, and I was doing my own thing. I still went to church. And I tried out all these churches. And because I missed them when I was growing up, I was called right into the ministry, right into the works of God. And, and I'm glad I was. I'm not ashamed about any of that. But I went out to try to find a place where I could go and get rejuvenated and rebuilt back up. And I went to a lot of wonderful churches. But the message wasn't there. There seemed to be a message that seemed to pat us on the back, rub our head a little bit. Now, please, don't get me wrong and read the wrong thing into this. And kind of encourage us, but we didn't have any meat. What to do, how to do it. Why is the enemy doing this? How come of this? Why am I suffering some of this? None of those answers were in there. And I'm thinking, something is missing. And God said, preach the gospel. Not encouragement only, not revealing sin only, but preach the gospel so that an individual person can take the word of God, apply it in their life, and get results, even if they're somewhere away from church. What if you were on some oil rig somewhere out in the sea? All you had your Bible, and, and there wasn't anybody else fellowshipping? Oh, Lord, get me off this. No, you have your Bible. Get together and get the word of God in your heart so it produces tremendous things. Can you say amen? All right, go with me to Isaiah 9, 6. We're going to look at the scripture. Isaiah 9, 6, if you have your PDA, you know, makes it quick. I, I used to love to hear the rattle of pages, you know. <laughs> you know, amen. Here's it says, for unto us a child is born. And a son is given. And the government will be upon his shoulder. His name shall be called Wonderful. How many know him as Wonderful? Counselor. How many's ever received his counseling? How many know he's Mighty God? Everlasting Father and Prince of Peace. I don't know about you, but I like peace. I like it when there's peace at home and peace at work. Peace at church and peace everywhere I go. Why? Because we walk with the Prince of Peace. Jesus said, my peace I give you, not as the world giveth to you. I give you my peace. And God says to prepare ourselves with our feet being shod with the preparation of peace. God says the peace I give you passes all your understanding of it. Aren't you glad? But I'd rather operate with peace in my heart than in turmoil. Amen. All right. So, a couple of points. Jesus had to bypass the block of the devil. How many here understand that the devil had blocked God's entry into this earth at one time? Can you remember that? Way back in the beginning, when God gave authority to Adam and Eve, he said, Adam, this is uh, Genesis 1, 26, I give you authority over all the works of my hand, over the birds, 
the animals and the sea, all over every creature that creepeth, even the creep himself. Carry paraphrased. Okay? So Adam had authority over that. But we see that Satan come in on a serpent, plume serpent, got Adam and Eve's attention, and they committed high treason. They sinned. Now their genome, their genes in their physical body were changed, and Satan entered their heart. Now the earth that was set up to respond to God in Adam now could not respond to God in Adam because it wasn't God in Adam any longer. It was the enemy. Are you with me? All right. So God was now outside of the planet looking in. And you might say, well, he's God. He could just, just thump everybody down here, cleanse the whole thing. And wipe everything out. No, we can't. Why? Because once God sets something in motion, it's got to finish through. That's why God's perfect. Every seed produces after its own kind and will runs its course. So if he made you eternal, you're going to run your course eternally, whether it be for good or bad. And he made Satan eternal, so he made the choice of being evil so now he's eternally evil. Amen? So something that's made to live forever cannot be killed. That's why you and I either go up or down. Thank God we're going up because we made that choice. Amen? That's why Satan cannot be annihilated, cease to exist, because he's eternal. So he has to be eternally caged up in the lake of fire. You understand? So God just can't change all that. Now God is outside of the planet looking at his people who are totally lost, totally getting corrupted, totally living next door to giants and all kinds of crazy stuff, desiring that somebody from the planet would call on him and make a covenant with him and ask him to come in and intercede. So that's why all through the Old Testament we see mankind crying out to God Asking for God to intervene and have a covenant. Why? Because God needs invitation. So if God was outside Carrie's door, Linda's door, Carrie and Linda's door, and he's standing out there, he will stand out there forever until I ask him to come in. The same with the people in the world. God does not jump in on them. He has to find a way that he can get their attention to ask them to come into their heart. Once they do that, he goes, well, thank you. Now I'm able to do something. So the basis of giving. God so loved the world that he gave. Amen. We gave in return our heart to God, didn't we? And now because we gave our heart to God, God's able to work with us. He's able to work on us. He's able to work in us. Can you say amen? All right. So Jesus had to bypass the block of the enemy controlling this world and have permission with the people who are born here legally to ask God to come on in, such as Abraham. Remember Abraham? He's in the Ural of the Chaldees. By the way, they did find Ur in the Chaldees. They did find it over there in, in the People Crescent, right over there by Iraq. And they found pyramids and all kinds of stuff there. But Abraham was a part of that country, and there were a lot of Nephilim there. And he, and he cried out. He says, Lord, there's got to be something more than worshiping sticks and stones <coughs> and potentates and all these people oppressing one another. Is there a God? And he cried out, and God, guess who showed up? God did. And, you know, he announced himself. And God said, I am El Shaddai. El God Shaddai. All provider. God the provider. Okay? I am all provision. Okay? Abraham, anything you need, I'll provide it. Now, we're not talking lusts here, but we're talking anything Abraham needs. And so God says, I'm going to make you a, 
a, a father of many nations, changes his name and everything. Why? Because God needed the invitation. Now, let me ask you. So, so now that you and I have made our invitation to God, do we ever invite him back again? This is not a trick question. You always look at me like I'm going to trick you. You should be inviting him every day, not to save you, but to work more in your life every day. God has to have invitation. Let's say there's an area in our lives that maybe it's rough, like my area was getting upset and, and getting hurt easily. I got to give God invitation in that area. First, I have to recognize I have that area. And then I have to ask God invitation in that area so he could do something about it. Because I, I can be good for a few days. I don't know about you. My wife will tell you. But after, if I don't pray, if I don't read the word, even my good becomes evil spoken. <laughs> Hello. Amen. Because you have a weed you carry around. Our flesh is like a big old weed. You got to put it under the weed killer. You got to put the rest of your life under the physician. Why? Because he makes everything in the middle of a storm run white. Right. My wife and I have never had so such great peace and great answers to prayer as we have here in the last two years. Because because of this and all this, I, I literally thought that ministry here was over with. Because how am I going to get around? How am I going to preach? How am I going to play drums? How am I going to excite people to come to church? How am I going to do all these kind of things? And God says, hey, I love God. He says, you're not. He says, I am. Oh, whew. that just makes it easier that way. Can you say amen? <laughs> But you think about it, we get wrapped up. We want to. We somebody gives us a Christmas gift. We get all upset because we don't have one for him, for them. Come on, let's get rid of the nonsense. Come on, come on, come on, come. Naturally, you want to give people things. Best thing you can give out for Christmas: get yourself some nice Bible tracts. And everyone that's kind to you, give them something. Give them Jesus. Something that explains how beautiful he is, how wonderful he is. See, isn't that the best gift to give? Now, I know what it's like to give our children gifts and, and give my wife gifts, and she knows to give me some gifts and all that kind of thing. But even if nobody gave us any gifts, that's not going to create my joy. It's not going to max out my joy or minimize my joy because my joy is in Jesus. Now, if a gift comes to me, wow! It's like frosting on a cake, extra. Hello. See, then we're in the right perspective of those things. All right, go with me to Hebrews chapter 10. Talking about Jesus. Remember, the miracle of getting Christ to be born in the earth was a miracle indeed. It will stagger the mind. If anybody understood all that had to go through, God had to go through to get his son to be born in this earth. Hebrews chapter 10, verse 5. Now, we're going to reflect the Old Testament and the New Testament for just a little bit. And it says in verse 5, Hebrews 10. You got it? Okay. Therefore, when he came into the world, a child was born. He said, Sacrifice and offering you did not desire, but a body you have prepared for me. In other words... Bulls, goats, turtle doves, red heifers, all of these sacrifices were all for a time to cover sin. Okay? But a body was given me, Jesus said, so I might eradicate sin, that I not only cover it, but I remove it. It's the sin blotter. It's the sin remover. So Jesus became the very last sacrifice. So when you and I accept him as our Lord and Savior, all of our sin is forgiven, past, present, and future. Yet, we still need God's intervention. And because God, the Holy Spirit, is a gentleman, he must feel welcome. When, when a husband and wife are arguing, does God feel welcome? God's still there. 
but he doesn't feel welcome because no invitation has been given him to get in the middle of that situation and intervene. So you've got to be a person that they can say, help me, help me, help me, help me all the time. I mean, God does things that we cannot do. God covers areas that we cannot see needs to be covering. So God, help me, help me, help me. And not because the me's in there. It's just, Lord, I recognize that I can't do really anything without you intervening. So I want you to always have an open, t open invitation to come in behalf of my life. So therefore, when he came into the world, sacrifice and offering you did not desire. You don't desire calves and heifers and turtle doves anymore. But a body you have prepared for me, that body was going to be the last sacrifice. In burnt offerings and sacrifices for sin, you have no pleasure because it only covered it for a year. But it didn't remove the sin nature in mankind. Then I said, Behold, I have come in the volume of the book, the Old Testament. It is written of me to do your will, O God. So all through Genesis 3.15, all the way through Isaiah and through Deuteronomy and all through the Scripture, Jesus was prophesied that he was going to be born. He would come. He would take our sins. He would rescue us. He would die. And on the third day, he would rise again. Amen. Now, <clears throat> I would say that was quite a bit of advance notice for the devil, wouldn't you say? God says, look, there's nothing you can do about it, Satan. The seed of the woman is going to crush your head. <laughs> nothing you can do about it. That's why Paul always said, if we're going to try to follow the law, we're going to fail. Because we're going to first feel like we can't live up to it. Second, we can't feel we can live it through. And the second of all, it doesn't cover us from the attacks of the enemy. But in the New Testament, not only do we have God living on the inside of us, but we have the blood of God covering us. We have the armor on us. We have the angels. We have the name. We have the word. We have all of these things. The only time you and I get shot at is when we're doing our own thing. Oh, me. <laughs> Bless your what I mean by doing this, my own thing is a selfish thing. You see, a selfish thing that you know in your heart that God says, mm -mm, leave that alone. I'll help you leave that alone. You follow what I'm saying? Otherwise, Satan can't touch you. Every man is tempted when he's drawn away of his own desires, his own desires, people's own desires that draw him away. Amen. He said in the last days, even the Antichrist today is, is, is well amongst us. Why? Because it denies the fact that Jesus can be the Lord of your life. Satan says, oh, yeah, Jesus loves you, and he's a wonderful idea, but he was just a man. No, no, he's the very love of your life. He's the very armor of your life. He's the very blood of your life. He's the very peace of your life, the very joy of your life. And outside of him... You're not going to receive those things. Why? Because you become easy pickings for the picker. You know what's neat about chickens besides eating them? Is chickens will turn on anybody if they look like their food. <laughs> I, that's not so neat about chickens. Well, it, it, chickens pick and, and bite and pick and bite, and the Bible warns us, don't be biting and devouring one another, right? So we learn not to do that. Somebody wants to say, well, did you see so-and-so? Look what they did. And I said, no, in fact, I probably did not see them. And if I did, I'm not going to pay attention to it because they're God's property. And so we've got to learn to think, act, operate the way God would have us to operate. Someone say amen. A couple of points underneath Hebrews chapter 10. Okay, it says, he had to be announced. So God announced his son to be born in the earth. Nothing Satan could do about it. Amen? Two, we can choose him. We can choose life. We can follow him. 
we can know his voice, okay, and we can follow him with his perfection working on the inside of us. Thirdly, he fulfilled the demands of what the law said. The law said they're worthy of death. They can't live up to the standard. If you, if you break the law, you're guilty of the law. You should, be you should die. But Jesus paid our entire debt. So instead of giving us death because we've fallen short and have Satan's sin in our flesh, God gave us life. And he says, if you'll hold on, you'll overcome to the end. I'll give you a white stone. Anybody here know anything about a white stone? A white stone, there were two stones the priest covered in his, in his breastplate. One was white, one was black. And when people would do something wrong, they were to grab a stone and, and stone them, okay? Now, we think that they were going to grab huge rocks, and they did do this too, but, and then they would throw them and stone the person to death. But the first stoning came whether they received a white rock, forgiveness, or a black rock, guilty. And so when Jesus sat down and rode in the sand and the woman caught in adultery, and, and he says, you, with the fir you without sin cast the first stone. They were not going to throw the stone necessarily at her as throw the stone down before their feet whether they thought they were guilty or the white stone, they were not guilty. And God says in the book of Revelation that he that overcometh, I will give you a white stone. You are not guilty. Someone say with me, I am not guilty by the blood of Jesus and by the love of Jesus. I am not guilty, so I will not hold anybody's guilt against them. Amen. How many didn't know that about the, the white stone? Now you know why I, he says, he that overcometh, I will give you a white stone. Okay? And if they all had black stones, they would pick them up and <laughs> gone would be that person. Aren't you glad we didn't live in the Old Testament? <laughs> Amen. Amen. Okay, so Jesus fulfilled all the demands for our sin and broke the curse. <clears throat> He's now our way of escape. From the enemy. You might say, well, what do I do if I feel like I'm under attack? Under attack? Number one, keep quiet. Number two, draw into Christ. Number three, start praising the Lord. And number four, watch God trump the enemy. Right in the midst of that trial. Number one, keep quiet. Number two, draw in. Number three, start praising the Lord because he's the one that fights the battle. Okay? Amen? What would I say the fourth one was? Huh? Yeah, watch him work the victory. Amen. I hope you got that, Sherry. <laughs> Bless your heart. <laughs> Amen. All right, let's move on to John chapter 10, and we'll finish up with this. I sure love you. You're wonderful. Huh? I, yeah. Whatever you can imagine. Okay. <laughs> In John chapter 10, we're going to pick up at verse 1. Now, this is what I call the law in Scripture of double reference. Everyone say double reference. That means that it refers to a couple of things. Okay? Not just one thing, and that's it couple of things here. First of all, the door, we know the door is Jesus, but also the door is legal birth here in the earth. Being born here legally. Okay, everyone say legally. Being born here. Let me ask you, was Satan born here? So he would be a thief and a robber, wouldn't he? Amen. But you were born in this planet, weren't you? Amen. So you have legal say or legal entry. What do you mean, Pastor Kerry? Well, just being born here means that you have the right to choose. Okay, Satan already made that choice, so he doesn't have the right to choose. You do. You can choose life and walk in it, or you can choose death and walk in death. 
Thank God you're smart enough to choose life. Say amen. So the door is Jesus, also the door is being born here legally. <clears throat> now, anybody that's not born here legally has no say here. What do you mean? Well, if I wasn't born in Sherry's house, I would have no say about everybody in the house. I'm a alien. I'm a foreigner to the house. Oh, no, you're not, Patrick. You're a, no, I understand all that. Okay. And in, in the earth, if you weren't born in the earth, you have no legal say here. Satan got his legal say when Adam committed treason and gave it to him. That's why God said to uh, Lucifer or Satan, when he came up with all the other angels reporting on their planets they were in charge of, he says, what are you doing here? In other words, Satan, how did you get back up here? On Adam's authority. Adam gave me his authority, and because he signed it over to me, I have legal entry into your presence on behalf of Adam. Could you imagine the dirge God had to look at? Saying, you're, you're, you got yours coming, and God has to be patient dealing with this. Okay, you with me? Are you still with me? <clears throat> Verse 1, most surely I say to you, he does not enter the sheepfold but by the door, but climbs up some other way, the same as a what? Thief and a robber. Well, who's the thief and the robber? He didn't come in by the door. He wasn't born here. <coughs> he stole his authority from Adam. So, so now God has to come in to this earth to have say here. What must he have to do? He has to get born here. He has to be born here in order to have say here. Why? Because he's outside of the planet looking for an end to the planet to rescue his children that was stolen out of his hands. So Jesus had to be born here legally out of a woman yet without sin. So this is the miracle of the child was born. So most assuredly I say to you, he that does not enter the sheepfold but by the door, but climbs up some other way, <coughs> the same as a thief and a robber. But he who enters by the door, Jesus, is the shepherd of the sheep. See it? <coughs> to him the doorkeeper opens. To him the sealer of the Holy Spirit opens. And the sheep hear his voice. And he calls his own sheep by name and leads them out. So not only is he entered in by the door, but he becomes the door to those that call on his name. Now, how many here has ever seen a sheepfold? How about a sheep pen? So, so that you see one, a sheep pen has no gate. It's an opening. The sheep are in the pen... And they're, they're safe from harm there. And the shepherd stands in front of the pen and becomes the door. So if any wolf comes to the sheep, he has to go in through the door. The shepherd's not about to let that happen. Can you say amen? It's only when the sheep go out through the door and they get out in the countryside and graze that they become open for the enemy to attack them. <clears throat> so we always want to march in, in groups, not off by ourselves, and close to the shepherd so he can use his staff or rod to fend the enemy away. Can you say amen? <coughs> so being the door to the, sh the sheepfold, he can let sheep in, even goats, but he won't let wolves in. Can you say amen? So is Jesus the door of your sheepfold? Amen. And if you trust him, then the enemy shouldn't be able to come in. Can you say amen? And certainly you've gained enough knowledge by now and wisdom by grace of God 
You're not going to wander too far from the pin. Can you say amen? That's what happened when we got straight. We went astray. We went astray and we got beat up, didn't we? Well, you know, don't raise your hand or anything. Okay, can you see the two meaning of the door here? This is the miracle. God had to be born in this planet. Well, how does God get born? <coughs> you see the miracle in Luke and in Matthew. The devil, right in front of his nose, I mean, every time he heard something was going on in the earth, he would begin to mass up a bunch of killing. Because the devil still believes that the Messiah is still going to come, even though he's been kicked up and beat up by the Messiah that already came. What do you mean, Pastor Kerry? Look at all those Jews that were murdered during World War II. Satan sacrifices. Hitler sacrificed all those Jewish people for his God, the God of the devil. Hitler blamed those people for every bad thing that ever existed. Who does that sound like? So one of the things that I try to teach young Christians is you got to know right off what's of God, what's not of God. What is of God, what's not of God. Because you will, if you don't know which one is which, you're liable to yield what's not of God and, and liable to resist what is of God. So you got to know that everything negative, everything that tears down, everything that hurts, causes pain, makes you sick, any of that is not of God. Sickness, illness is not of God. God is not using my leg situation to keep me hung, humble. These do happen to remind us that we're in a fallen world and my body <coughs> is going to be replaced. But this isn't God's doing. This is the enemy's doing. In ignorance about diet, <laughs> who knows I had diabetes until I had toes removed off of my right foot. <coughs> I didn't know I had diabetes. Whose fault was that? I'm going to blame it on the devil and me. God had nothing to do with it. So we learn to filter what lines up with God we can say yes to and filter out what doesn't belong to God and say no to. Amen. For example, something simple. I mean, it's really hard. Your friend calls you. You haven't seen your friend for a year. Says, hey, I'm going to be up there on Sunday. <clears throat> I'll spend some time with you. Okay, listen. Your answer is, yeah, I want you to come to church with me. Oh, no, I don't go to church, and I want you to skip church and be with me. Where would that come from? I, I, it's hard to believe that, that the enemy would, would do something like that. So what do you do? You have to go to God and say, God, <clears throat> should I take the time of meeting with God's people and meeting before you at, uh, in God's house to meet with them? Uh, and, and let the Lord answer. <clears throat> now, there's not always a perfect answer for everything. God might say, spend time, time with them, but share Jesus with them the entire time. Amen. The Bible actually says that we're not to Skip church. Did you notice? Have you? How many's ever read that in the scripture? Let me see your hands. Where the Bible says, "Don't skip church." Now, if you're going to a wedding, that's okay. If you're sick, where you're hugging the porcelain god, I mean, that's excusable and all. But if you're just bopping off and doing this and doing all that, <coughs> you're in danger zone. You're in the danger zone. Why? Because God's not right there to stand in front of your sheep gate. You're off somewhere in the, in the green pasture where the wolves hang out. So what am I saying to you? My, my goodness, I mean, not everybody can make church every week. But you think about it, two hours on a Sunday a week, we can't do that. And I wonder why, if there was, ever was a war, like another World War III, would we be conscientious objectors? You know what I mean? So I don't want to hammer this too much because you guys are the choir. You're here. But think about that, how it breaks God's heart 
at least Linda's heart, no, <laughs> my heart, when, when people, they got every kind of excuse and, and doing all kinds of stuff like that, and then they come back after about a month or so, and they're beat to a tar. They look like they've been dragged through a now hall backwards, and, and you're going, well, what happened to you? And they go, well, I thought I was doing good. Well, if you thought you were doing good, the first moment you got slapped, you knew you were in the wrong spot. Thank you for that one amen. If I was Baptist, I'd keep going, you know. <laughs> but no, <laughs> you guys are wonderful. <coughs> Don't you think it affects God when he sees your suffering? Uh, doesn't it, it affects God when he says, you know, I gave you some things to do so you wouldn't suffer this that we do anywhere? I want to show you something. God, in spite of all of that, loves us and reaches through all of that and says, come here, let me hold you. Let me level you, you know. You'll get it in this time. You'll make it. He never gives up on us. Aren't you glad? Amen. <coughs> all right. Amen. So finally, down in verse 7, John 10. Then Jesus said to them again, Most assuredly I say to you, I am the door of the sheep full, of the sheep. All who ever came before me, talking about Pharisees, Sadducees, doctors of the law, the religious people of the day, all who ever came before me, I see in this, Becky, are thieves and robbers. Wow, that's quite an insult. For the Pharisees, huh? For the Jewish people. They're thieves and robbers. Why? Because they think they can be saved by their pious, by their, their dedication to the law, by their waving flags and following feasts. Wonderful things. Those are wonderful things. They're not bad things. But how many know just because you follow the feast of the tabernacles, it's not going to save you? There are some that believe it will. So the idea is, it isn't our ceremony that saves us. It isn't our ideas of being good that saves us. It's having Jesus saving us and him standing at the door of our sheepfold, protecting us, watching over us. He doesn't sleep night and day. So he said, all who ever came before me are thieves and robbers, but the sheep did not hear them. Verse 9 I am the door, and if anyone enters by me, he will be saved. And this is talking about being saved, entering through Jesus, not through the law. By me, he will be saved and will go in and out and find pasture. Now you know what that means. They're in the sheepfold, but they can go in and they can go out as long as they stay next to the shepherd. Can you say amen? How many did learn something new you never knew before? Amen. As long as you've got the shepherd with you. Amen. Let me introduce you to my shepherd. Sherry did that at her mom's birthday celebration. So let me introduce you to my pastor. I thought Linda and I were so honored. Amen. Because, uh, you know, a lot of people don't recognize that she's worked so hard, but thank you so much. And now he says, now look what he says. They'll go in and we'll be saved and go in and out and find pasture. The thief does not accept to steal kill, and destroy. The only reason he's anywhere near you is you're too dangerous for him to let go. You're stomping on him. You're blasting his kingdom. You're reaching out towards people. You're helping them all in those areas. <coughs> Amen? And so he comes by. Paul said it this way. Because of the multitude of the revelations that I have, a, a messenger of Satan was assigned to me to keep dealing me blows to help me give up. Now, a lot of people read in that that it's God. No, it could be a sickness in your body. It could be a temp tempter. It could be an evil spirit. It could be the person you married. <laughs> God forbid. <coughs> God forbid. Amen. You follow what I'm saying? <laughs> but God is not using the enemy to keep you humble. He hates the enemy. He just knows that you have a will. And if you want to, you can go wherever you want, do whatever you want within means. But he'd rather you take him along with him. All right, and finishing. 
Jesus is the door of the sheep. Can you say amen? All right. Jesus came in through what door? He came in to be born into this world through the door of the birth. When God speaks or does, there is a signature and a mark that he leaves each time he talks to you. Can anybody tell me what that signature is? Make a stab at it. You saintly scholarly. Number one, God will always comfort you, even if he has to correct you. Carrie, you know you're acting a little bit out of sorts, but see, there's the love there. He exhorts me. Here's what you should do. If you do this, I'll help you do it. He comforts, exhorts, and edifies. If you do it, I'll build you up and you'll move to the next level of growth. If you got something out of that this morning, would you give the Lord a big hand clap? Amen. Amen.